everybody out there. This is James Major with Retina Consultants of Texas, AKA RCTX. And this is another one of our fabulous CE events. Uh, there will be two main speakers tonight, Dr. Fish, who will be speaking on a high, taking our old calendar and looking at different diagnoses from sort of start to finish over the years and, and what you need to know rapid fire style. And then Dr. Larkin, who's our UBI expert, will be doing scleritis, which is a new topic for us and should be very, very interesting. So welcome everybody. And these are the partners in Retina Consultants of Texas. Many of you know us all. Our newest partners that we'll highlight soon are Dr. Wynn and Dr. Larkin. Um, and Dr. Patel is also here. Everyone is on this call except I think Dr. Brown and Dr. Benz, Dr. Scheffler and Dr. Wyckoff had previous commitments. Everybody else you see on that picture are here. So very important, we wanna keep this interactive. So please text questions in the, in, the, in the chat Zoom text box. We wanna have questions, we wanna answer your questions, anything whatsoever. And then sort of the panelists that are not actually speaking will rapidly answer those. So please do not be shy, questions, questions, questions. A little bit, some housekeeping items before we get started. We of course have the Greater Houston Retina Research Foundation. This is our uh, nonprofit 501c3 arm that provides excellent research opportunities to our patients. So this is wonderful. Again, this is a our, our research entity that is separate financially from Retina Consultants of Texas. <clears throat> and this is what we use and, and essentially handles the money and the finances uh, for our very large, one of the largest in the nation research programs that really benefits patients. We have one of the strongest research programs in the nation retina wise, and we're able to provide patients with outstanding care who otherwise couldn't receive it. So thank you. Uh, there's a map of our offices, throw a dart at Houston, as I said before, and pretty much anywhere, north, south, east, or west, we're going to have, we will have an office. Um, our newest office that I mentioned last time, brand new, it opened about two months ago, is our Bel Air office. It is on the corner of Newcastle and Bissonette. The, we own roughly 16,000 square feet of the second floor. So that is our flagship office, which now holds our uh, the Greater, Retina, uh, Greater Houston <coughs> Retina Research Foundation, as well as our clinical entity. So many days, three uh, MDs are there. Dr. Larkin will be there along with of two of some of the older Retina and Houston's of Texas doctors, uh, all holding clinic there. It has everything you need, facilities, facility-wise in terms of the highest uh, end imaging equipment, very, very high-tech imaging equipment, as well as lasers and anything else we need to treat to treat patients. Pneumatic retinopexies, it's all there. So that is our flagship office. And there's a picture of it. Again, it's on the corner of Bissonette and Newcastle, right basically where 59 intersects with 610, right in that corner near Episcopal High School, if you're familiar with that. And you can see listed at the bottom, the doctors. We still maintain our Skurlock office in the medical center itself next to Methodist and mainly Dr. Fish and Dr. Scheffler see patients there. So Dr. Fish and Dr. Scheffler, in addition to seeing patients in Newcastle Bisnet, also our old medical center office, which we still maintain uh, is really, um, I don't know about Dr. Fish and Dr. Scheffler. I'd like to extend a welcome to Dr. Larkin, who will be <coughs> speaking, she'll be our second speaker tonight. Uh, she comes to us from UT Houston, both resident medical school and residency. She then did a fellowship at the Casey Institute, which is a fantastic program. And her specialty is ocular immunology and uveitis. So she, along with Dr. Henry and Dr. Kim, are, are three uveitis specialists. We corner the market in, in Texas, really, and anywhere maybe in the United States on uveitis and inflammation within the eye. Three outstanding people, and you'll hear from her tonight. So welcome, Dr. Larkin, and we'll hear the second talk on scleritis from Dr. Larkin tonight. There are other retina specialists that we mentioned before, Dr. Patel, and Dr. Patel mainly is in the north. He's at the Woodlands, Kingwood, and Northwest office. And then Dr. Wynn is also in Pearland. She's with me on Mondays at our new medical center, um, Newcastle Bissonette office. So we welcome Dr. Wynn, who you've heard from before, and Dr. Patel as well. You've heard me mention it before, but the RCTX image portal, this is the <clears throat> HIPAA compliant manner by which you can send, you, there's a simple registration, you see the website there, and you complete the short, easy form. Once your email is confirmed and you get into the platform, you will then be able to send us HIPAA compliant information with all the patient information you need, including names, color pictures of a presumed horseshoe retinal tear or chirpy or melanoma or whatever it may be, and we send the same way back. So this is essentially 
a modern era that gone are the days of the old fax machine where you sent a picture or drew a picture on a piece of paper. These are HIPAA compliant, wonderful color images that we can both send to you and you can send to us. And so kudos to Sarah Barbatano, who's with us, who essentially uh, developed and promoted this. And it's a wonderful tool that really enhances communication and patient care. That's the RCTX image portal. Any questions about that, Sarah will have her email at the end of the talk and please email her. But signing up is very easy. And once you do it, that's it. Dr. Fish, are you there? Dr. Fish has a wonderful talk and he always spices his talks up with not just ophthalmology, but some learning perhaps about music or other things. I have a sneaking suspicion that we're gonna hear about some good groups musically. So Dr. Fish, take it away. It, the floor is yours. All righty. Okay. Uh, am I muted? Everybody hear me? Yeah, you're fine. Okay, good. Well, James, thank you for uh, the introduction. And yes, so I was uh, asked by Sarah to do a CE talk and uh, she said, well, why don't you just kind of take some of the old cases that we've done from calendar cases, um, you know, from years back. And I said, well, okay, that sounds fine. And then I started thinking about, well, what, what can I call that? And so I came up with a title yesterday and today, which is coincidentally the name of a Beatles album. But so I'm gonna diverge for a second and give you a little bit of Beatles trivia. In 1967, the Beatles released Sgt. Pepper's and then all of the records after that, Sgt. Pepper's through Let It Be, were all the exact same in the United States as they were in the United Kingdom. But prior to that, Parlophone and EMI in the United Kingdom only released seven albums. Those are considered kind of canonical. But in the United States, Capitol Records wanted to make, well, they wanted to capitalize on the Beatles' success. And so they, only, they released some 11 or albums that were shorter, had fewer songs. And uh, basically, one of those albums is called Yesterday and Today. This is the album cover that when I bought this record in about 1965 or so, that's what it looked like. The four lads casually posed there in this little steamer trunk. But the original cover art for this album, Yesterday and Today, was this. The Beatles posed in these butcher smocks with pieces of meat and dolls that were decapitated. This is now called infamously the butcher cover. This record, if you can find it, is worth a ton of money. Capitol Records released a bunch of these records uh, to the horror of the, of the parent company. So what they did is they quickly changed to this, um, you know, more benign cover. However, um, what ended up happening is there were so many of these that had been printed that they printed up some labels. So let's see if I can get this to work. these labels covered over the butcher cover. And so if you can find a record that kind of looks like this and looks kind of old, it might be a butcher cover yesterday and today. And if you find one of those, then you could be a millionaire, which is kind of the format of our, of our show tonight. It's kind of a quiz show. And uh, they kind of, the questions kind of start pretty easy. They get harder and harder and towards the end. Very, very, rare things that you may never see. But luckily, we have Dr. Sagar Patel, who is going to be our full-time resident audience, phone a friend, lifeline person. So Dr. Patel will fill in the blanks. But the idea of this is that as soon as we present a case, if you guys can start typing away at the answer in the text, and my partners will be looking out for this, we'll give you a few seconds. And uh, Hopefully we can get some answers and recognize those people who chime in with the correct answer. So is everybody ready to play who wants to be a millionaire? First of all, I just want to acknowledge that all of these cases that we've been doing the past 29 years of calendars, and as the time flies by, it's just, just important to recognize that you guys were the source of the vast majority of every one of these calendar cases. We're all referred by doctors like you. So these are the most interesting or the most photogenic cases from each year. 
Okay, our first question is kind of an easy one. So ring in, chime in, whatever. What is this? So uh, thanks, Dr. Fish. Um, I'm going to just refer to this chat if anyone gets it right. Um, it looks like we got a couple responses here, many, many saying horseshoe tear. Um, and then the first uh, from Dr. Oh, so many answers. Oh, uh, Dr. Rojas, I think he, they got it right. Um, looks like an RRD, so retinal tear with a retinal detachment, supratemporal. Um, can't tell exactly, but I'd probably say this is a Mac on RRD. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah, so this is correct. The answer is retinal detachment. Um, I'm, I'm really big on, on getting OCTs. I think all of us like OCTs on every patient. And in this instance, having an OCT to see where the fluid goes to, uh, because many times we are sent a patient. Uh, and the status of the macula, of course, is very important. And that OCT can really help break the tie in cases where it's not immediately evident that the macula is attached or detached. So correct. The $5 question or $100 question, whatever the lowest is, rental detachment. So next case, what is this? So I'll give the, the audience a second to take a look. <clears throat> got an answer. We got a couple coming in. Uh, <clears throat> Scleral buckle is correct. Um, that's what it looks like, at least to me. It looks like there's a, a band encircling the, um, the peripheral retina, providing a little uh, support to the peripheral retina, to the vitreous base. Um, also, it looks like there's a tear um, that you, you're circling over there uh, at 3 o'clock, temporal. Um, and there's some cryo scarring around it, which is probably used to, to seal that area. Yep. So these are easy. These are, these are the things that the millionaire contestants just ripped through. Okay, what's this? Hmm. This is the $250 question. Well, there we go, Dr. Reese. Um, it looks like, I'd, I'd say this is probably macular degeneration, the dry kind, um, particularly with uh, central GA. Um, pretty significant center involving GA. I'm sure the patient doesn't see so well. What's interesting about this is um, we actually have studies for this now. Um, before, you know, we didn't really have any options for these sort of patients. We tried all sorts of things, but now we're trying a couple of drugs that are proving to be uh, pretty uh, pretty exciting and may offer a treatment for these patients. Yeah, so geographic atrophy. And yeah, we have clinical trials for this. I think the important thing that I'd like to emphasize about this is not every practice, uh, optometric or even retina practice has autofluorescence. Autofluorescence is key to following this and making the diagnosis. You can sometimes get a pretty good idea of a patient having geographic atrophy from the OCT scan, but if there's ever a doubt as to whether or not, gee, I wonder if this is dry, I wonder if it's wet, I wonder if it's geographic atrophy, don't, don't necessarily write off, oh, you don't have to go see anybody, because there are areas of geographic atrophy that can be sometimes very difficult to spot on conventional exam or OCT, and we are happy to evaluate any patient that you suspect might have some benefit in a clinical trial, even if they look to be completely dry. So yes, geographic atrophy. Here's the next question, the $1,000 question. Hmm. Oh, there we go, <laughs> Dr. Brown, right off the bat. Um, I think it's probably a melanocytoma. Could be confused with a melanoma, but important distinction there. Um, with this, it's, it's typically benign, which is, uh, the, the more important characteristic that differenti differentiates it from a melanoma, but it can look pretty similar. Yeah, Dr. Scheffler's not on the call, but I called her this morning and said, Amy, uh, malignancy rate of melanocytoma. And I thought it was like one in a million or something, like finding a beetle's butcher cover or something. And she said it's 3%, which was surprising to me. So... Uh, that's a higher number than I would have imagined. So although I'd, it doesn't change my worry level, 
and probably shouldn't change your worry level, it does sort of point to the need for regular follow-up photography and monitoring of these patients because it's a non it's a non-trivial rate of conversion into something malignant. Okay, here's the next one. What are we looking at here? <clears throat> oh, there we go. Um, we're getting a couple of answers here. Dr. Rojas again coming through. Um, looks like uh, PDR with um, significant non perfusion and NV peripherally. Uh, yeah, probably need to treat this person pretty quickly. With yeah, I mean, or, or injections. Yeah, we have a, a bit of a running uh, debate, healthy debate within our practice about what is the role of good old fashioned panretinal photocoagulation for PDR. I think all of us would incorporate anti VEGF treatment. There are, I don't know, probably a third to a half of us that would still also, in addition to anti VEGF, would do PRP. But this is a patient that is high, high risk proliferative diabetic retinopathy and, you know, very, very close to vitreous hemorrhage and loss of vision. All right, this is like the $2,500 to $5,000 question, a little bit harder. Yeah, definitely getting harder. This is the autofluorescence, which kind of highlights the, the small maybe you would call them very small, maybe punctate, maybe white. I can't remember. Is there a Latin word for white, maybe? Hmm. The teleform dystrophy, but uh, maybe. I, looking at it, you know, I, it does, as you mentioned, Dr. Fisher, I do see a lot of small yellow-white dots in the retina. Um, I would say probably fundus albi punctatus. Which is correct. The, the lifeline comes through. Way to go, Dr. Patel. Any, did anybody in the, in the audience get this one? Uh, we got some close responses, but not... not right. We had uh, a couple of people in the, in the Q&A got it. Oh, yay. Awesome. Yes, this actually a couple, definitely, mm -hmm. on the Q&A. This is a tough one because, I mean, I've only seen two maybe ever. So, you know, if a retina practice sees one a year, that's like a big year. So it's, it's not something that's terribly common, but it's very striking when it does come in. Anything else to say about fundus albi? So um, it's a pretty rare disorder, but typically what's interesting is that it looks really bad, but... The patients generally do okay. They do tend to have some night blindness in childhood, but they um, they don't tend to progress. The center involved, the, their center vision can can be pretty good, um, and and it's nice that they come in with this pretty unique finding. But they they some of them come in. You know, I've seen a couple of patients where they come in, they didn't even know they had this, um, and they just saw an eye doctor and and they picked it up. So yeah. not as bad as like you know RP and stuff, but. Yeah, fundus albi. Yeah, it's one, it's one of the congenital stationary night blindnesses. All right, what's this? Maybe it's actually possible that our doctors online know this better than we do. I didn't really know what it was when I first saw it. Oh, we're getting a bunch of answers coming through. Um, yeah, it looks, looks like an Optos photo, but there's something in the cornea maybe that's that's getting photographed as well, a horseshoe shaped thing, an intact uh, ring segment is probably what it is. Yep. So this is a patient with keratoconus. Sometimes when you take an Optos picture, you get interesting things that show up as shadows. So sometimes a dislocated IOL, an intact corneal implant. We've had several really cool Optos pictures that while it's trying to focus on the retina, you just get something pretty interesting looking in the anterior segment. So rapid fire. Okay, what's this? This is an older picture. This is a montage. So see how these pictures are all being stitched together. This is before Optos. This is the $10,000 question. Hmm. 
Yeah, Dr. Brown, um, looks like something bad. Uh, I'd, I'd say it's probably melanoma, coronal melanoma. That's exactly right. So this is a, a coronal melanoma. It's, that it, it, unfortunately, in the old photographs, you can't get a focus on things anterior and posterior, but you can get a real idea of the elevation of this mushroom-shaped choroidal melanoma. This is an immediate referral to our partner who couldn't make it tonight, Dr. Scheffler, one of the world's leading experts in ocular oncology, and I'm really grateful to, to have her when these kind of cases walk in the door. All right, getting more challenging. Hmm. Let's see. A little bit of opt optic nerve swelling here, maybe a little retinal lesion. The characteristic thing here is this, what's called a macular star figure. Yeah. And all of these things are classic for this condition. We're getting a couple um, neuroretinitis, cat scratch. Yep. I think that's Boom. what it is. That's Probably it. Bartonella. Dr. Henry, what's, what's, your, what's your preferred treatment for Bartonella or cat scratch neuroretinitis? So if we, if we prove it, it's Bartonella, um, I usually treat with doxycycline and rifampin uh, for four to six weeks. Um, you can also use azithromycin. And not every case of neuroretinitis is actually Bartonella. Um, so you, all, you can also get it from uh, syphilis, tuberculosis, um, toxocara can look like this, rickettsia, uh, but the great majority are going to be Bartonella. Toxoplasmosis, actually, too. You can get yes. toxo. And, and a lot of these patients, I'll also, once I've confirmed the diagnosis and started antibiotics, um, I'll, I'll put them on oral steroid taper as well, particularly if they have a lot of um, optic nerve swelling or a lot of <laughs> macular edema. Yeah. Really a great case because it just kind of demonstrates some of the very, very treatable entities, uh, infectious entities, was also a fantastic calendar case, probably, that's probably 15, 20 years ago. Okay, these are interesting and very pretty when you see them, and they are? Yeah, there we go, Dr. Martinez, bear tracks. So looks like a little bear's footprint kind of all over the place. I think the, the interesting thing about these is, you know, you can have a, a couple chirpies be a normal finding, but when you have a lot of them like this, where they're grouped together, you actually, you want to start thinking of uh, systemic diseases um, like Gardner's syndrome um, that can give you colon cancer as well. So this is, you know, it's a helpful thing to keep an eye out for. So here's the interesting thing. And I, I learned this one from Dr. Major. These kind of bear tracks, I, I'm pretty sure I'm saying this right, are not terribly associated with Gardner's syndrome. I'm going to, the next one, I'm just going to do a gimme for free because this one is these pigmented lesions, these chirpies with the halo around them, those little tadpole looking things, though, and that are almost always pointing towards the optic nerve, like football shaped as Dr. Major called them. Those are the ones that have the association with familial adenomatous polyposis or Gardner syndrome. But the other one, the regular bear tracks, I think if I'm remembering a, a CE talk from Dr. Major many years ago, that they're not terribly associated with, with Gardner syndrome. James, am I, am I saying that right? Yeah, Richard, that's correct. Th these lesions, the football shaped lesions with the white tails are called POFL, pigmented ocular, ocular fundus lesions, P-O-F-L, whereas the grouped bear tracts have no association with Gardner syndrome. But even the, these, and, and again, they always point to the nerve, they have that white depigmented tail, tadpole or football shaped, these are strongly 99% plus associated with Gardner's syndrome um, and a, a, an FAP, familial adenomatous polyposis right. problem. Yep. Totally different, even though they call the other called the atypical to chirpy. Right. And then in contradistinction, here's another one. Anybody get this? And man, this is like, this is easily at the $100,000 level if you get this one. Oh, there we go. We got it. Polar bear, polar bear tracks. Yay. Boy, $100,000 of Bitcoin to whoever get, got that. Yeah, polar bear tracks are interesting lesions. They mean nothing, no association and with any disease and super, super rare. Only seen maybe two cases, three cases 
like ever, but super pretty to look at. All right, I'm gonna take a little break here and talk about bubbles. I've always liked bubbles ever since my first bubble bath. I like taking pictures of bubbles. I like blowing bubbles. I like scuba diving. I like everything about bubbles. And so I like pictures in the calendar that have bubbles, like this bubble that's sitting uh, after a retinal detachment repair. The last teeny little bit of gas was hanging right here onto the cup of the optic nerve, photographed it, and it became like January 1999 or something like that. Great case. Other little bubbles, like silicone oil bubble here, or a collection of silicone oil bubbles clinging on to a silicone IOL, terrible, you know, obstruction during surgery, but they make for great calendar photographs. This was heavy silicone oil being removed intraoperatively. The silicone oil is not done in the United States, but I was removing a, a silicone oil case that was done in Mexico. And instead of being lighter than water, it's heavier than water and made pretty bubbles, but kind of a difficult surgery. Uh, these are tough bubbles. These are perfluorocarbon liquid bubbles. When we're doing giant rental tears and other complicated surgeries, sometimes a little bit of this heavier than water liquid can get trapped underneath the retina, forming these bubbles on OCT. Uh, if, so long as they're not in the fovea, they generally don't produce a problem. So we usually just leave them alone. If they're subfoveal, then sometimes they require an operation to remove that little bubble. So back to the quiz, what are these bubbles? That's the very close up view. This was a calendar case from years ago. What are we looking at here? Almost looks like a, like a upside down hypopion. That's exactly right. We call this a reverse hypopion. And this is a really interesting case. We didn't do this, but it came into our practice. Notice the patient is faking. I haven't a clue how this happened, but this is emulsified silicone oil that migrated into the anterior chamber and forming this reverse hypopion. This was the cover of a calendar. I'm gonna kind of blow through a little bit of these gang just cause I'm a little short on time and I, I don't wanna take up Dr. Larkin's time, but this is a silicone oil bubble, again, referred in from another practice in which an IOL is floating on the, lower surface of this. Terrible disaster case. I can't remember who operated on this patient uh, to try and correct, remove the IOL. I wanna say it may have been Shaw, but uh, anyway, this, was, this, was, this came to us in very bad shape, but made for a very striking image. All right, back into the deep recesses of RCTX, RCH, VRC at the time. This is very rare. Type them in quick because I'm rapid yep. firing at this point. CMV. Yeah, CMV retinitis. Very common in AIDS patients in the uh, mid 90s. Came here in 92 and about half my practice was HIV, CM CMV retinitis. And a similar cousin. Anybody type it in quick? This is the lightning round. We got a couple frosted branch angiitis. Yeah, seriously? That's great. This is the $500,000 question. So, Sagar, you want to kind of riff on this for 20 seconds? Yeah, so um, big differential here, but you, you know, you want to rule out infectious etiology. So, um, herpes, CMV, uh, ARN, porn, you know, you got to do extensive lab workup. These patients, may have underlying diseases that immunocompromise them, such as HIV. Um, but this is going to be a, a vasculitis involves both the, um, uh, it's, so it's involving mainly the, perf, uh, the, the posterior arteries here. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that uh, it can, you know, it, it's just so many things that can cause it. So you do really have to do a, a, a pretty big workup. But you know, you're thinking like lupus, um, sarcoid, acute retinal necrosis, that kind of stuff um, that, that could do it potentially. Yeah, super striking appearance when you see it. Rare that we see vasculitis that wicked to, put, to give you this sort of frosted branch appearance. So a lot of our calendar cases came when we got new toys, like a wide angle lens for the Heidelberg that you had to hold onto the eyeball, it's about the size of a hand grenade called a Steringi lens. 
we were super excited when we got this thing called OCT and we could show central serous retinopathy with a little pigment epithelial detachment or vitreomacular traction on these early generation OCTs. We were all super excited when we went to small gauge surgery and could take pictures with operating microscope with an intraocular foreign body, a metallic foreign body that I removed a long time ago or peel an internal limiting membrane uh, and, and take pictures of it in the operating room. We were super excited about our new toys like a Pascal laser and took pictures and montaged them again before Optos became a thing and before anti-VEGF became a thing. This proliferative retinopathy was treated with these very precise grid computer controlled patterns that, from the Pascal laser. So this is a yesterday case. Uh, anybody know what this is? All my troubles seem so far away from the fovea. But this may be just, this has never done anymore, but this is laser to a choroidal neovascular membrane. And then, then the yesterday part is now it looks as though they're here to stay, which is the recurrence that frequently accompanied a thermal laser. They would almost always recur on the foveal side. But we just also bragged about this. This is, I'll give you a hint, it's a choroidal neovascular membrane, but this appeared in our, I believe, 2007 calendar, which gives you a hint. I think um, that's probably a similar process, but now we have a new treatment rather than lasering it. We can treat it with an injection, uh, anti-VEGF. Absolutely correct. So the today-ish part of this is choroidal neovascular membrane that we put in our calendar. We were pretty excited about the results from the Lucentis trials that we helped spearhead back in the day. These, This one is a very sad case. I'm just going to give the rest of these. This was a, a young woman who had psychosis as well as a drug problem and filled a tuberculin syringe with one cc of isopropyl alcohol, injected it into her eye through that little puncture wound there, which was lasered. Unfortunately, it infarcted her retina, gave her an air bubble to completely just destroyed all the vision in this eye. It was just a tragic, tragic case, a, but a very striking image of something just incredibly rare. A um, couple last ones I'm gonna blow through. This is the before and this is after. We used to see quite a few of these in the late 90s. Uh, Sagar, did you ever see one of these? I have not, I have not put one in either. Um, <clears throat> For my time, but uh, I think it's a Miragel scleral buckle. That is correct. This is the operative procedure of taking out a Miragel buckle because these, these scleral buckles that were put in in the early 90s by one of our partners who's no longer here, uh, and they were used across the country, but they swelled up with water. They caused enormous complications, and they were hard, hard, hard to take out. Every time you touched it, it crumbled into little pieces of cheese. So you had to take a cryoprobe and freeze the thing to get it to be removed from the eye. Myra gel scleral buckle. All right, this is the million dollar and last question. <clears throat> I'll give people a couple seconds. No, um, I think this is a pretty rare disease now, but it looks like um, pneumocystis causing a chorial retinitis maybe. That's um, probably more common before we used to treat um, immunosuppressed patients with prophylaxis such as Bactrim. Yeah, so back in the, in the HIV, in the, in the heyday of HIV, this is the million dollar question is indeed pneumocystis choroiditis, these yellow patches. Most AIDS patients had pneumocystis carini pneumonia. They were treated with inhaled antibiotics. So they would take pentamidine in an inhaled treatment, which was fine for the pneumonia, but still left them with systemic manifestations of the pneumocystis organism, which can present a solitary, or in this case, of just a horrible case of multifocal yellowish plaques uh, in the choroid. And this had to be treated with systemic 
antibiotics and usually responded pretty well. All right, so there's all kinds of things that didn't make the cut. In the Beatles case, there were all these songs that didn't make the Beatles. They broke up, they became solo artists, and Sarah later on is gonna send you guys a link to a Spotify playlist that many people have referred to as the Black Album. The tunes that had the Beatles stay together, they would have released on subsequent albums, but they're kind of from their earlier work. So I was listening to this today, Lots of wonderful, wonderful music from John, Paul, George, and Ringo. As solo artists, you'll be getting the Spotify playlist link that I kind of personally curated this morning. But in that spirit, and here's the place where everybody's going to shriek, but you can't hear it on a Zoom call, here are some cases that did not make the cut. This is a case of auto-enucleation, a patient who took, there's a Bible verse that talks about if your eye offends thee, pluck it out. And a psychotic patient did precisely that in a very manic, psychotic episode. Um, and of course, just horrible, horribly tragic. Didn't make the cut for the calendar, nor did this. Uh, just horrible knife injury. This is another trauma case that I actually think, I, I think I'm remembering correctly, did make the calendar. This is a industrial staple that penetrated the limbus and we were able to get a picture of it and it wasn't so grody that we had to kind of censor it like the other ones, but I, I, this one actually may have been a calendar case. Well, that's all I've got. I think I went a teeny bit over, but uh, happy to stick around and do anything over the chat. Uh, speaking of th all things yesterday and today, this is from a few weeks ago when the River Oaks Theater closed uh, for good. And so I will bid farewell and turn it over to Dr. Larkin. Dr. Larkin, yes. Take it away, Dr. Larkin. Thank you, Dr. Fish, very much. Always, I knew there'd be some neat Beatles stuff in there. Very neat, thank you. Dr. Larkin, if you're there, take it away from the right is. All right, I'm here. Can everyone see the slides? Oops. You can see him, Kelly. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Major, for introducing me. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And a special thank you to my fellow uveitis specialists, Dr. Kim and Dr. Henry. Um, tonight, I'm going to be talking about scleritis and how to work up and treat scleritis patient if they come into your clinic. So I'll be starting by presenting a case. Uh, Dr. Henry, you will know this case well, as you are now seeing this patient. And I wanna thank Dr. Henry also for providing the photos that I'm using here. So our patient is a 45 year old Asian male. He came to me initially with reports of redness in his eyes for about three months, worse in the left eye compared to the right. He had pain that was worse with movement and it was worse later in the day and overnight. He was gardening at the time of onset and he feels that some piece of soil or plant matter got into his eye. He was initially treated with topical tobramycin but continued to worsen. So he was referred to a cornea specialist. The cornea specialist switched him to Durazol and he reported some improvement but it didn't really resolve. Um, he's a steroid responder, so he was started on topical IOP lowering meds, and the only medication he's taking is PRN ibuprofen, um, but he feels like he's a really healthy guy. He doesn't have any medical problems. He doesn't want to take any systemic medications. Two months prior, he also was treated with 30 milligrams of oral prednisone for what he believes was an ear infection on the right. Ocular history is just presbyopia and eye medications are what we already covered, the Durazol four times a day in both eyes. He's taking olipatadine and Zelpros. He has no allergies and no medical history whatsoever, no surgical history and only taking PRN ibuprofen. On review of systems, when we started to dig a little bit deeper, um, he had this recent diagnosis of a right ear infection. So what he describes is a feeling of pressure in his ear and hearing loss and some tinnitus. So he was seen by an ENT and he was treated with oral prednisone at a maximum dose of 30 milligrams daily, which was tapered off over about two weeks. And he was also treated with oral amoxicillin. Um, but what he reports is that the auditory symptoms actually started simultaneously with the onset of his ocular symptoms. 
He does repeat, re report that he has frequent sinus congestion, but denies any episodes of epistaxis. He has recent onset of mild wrist pain, and otherwise his review of systems is negative. On exam, he's 2020 in the right eye and 2025 in the left. His intraocular pressure is fortunately normal. He has full motility and normal pupils. On examination, he has uh, a mild to moderate nodular scleritis inferiorly in the right eye. And in the left eye, he has severe scleritis that's present 360 degrees, and he has a nodule in that eye as well, temporally. Um, just some very rare secondary anterior chamber cell, but otherwise a normal exam. Um, so these are his photographs, and you can see in the right eye, um, a, a moderate level of scleritis present. There's a nodule present, which I think it's just harder to see in photos. Um, and the left eye has that sort of classic violaceous injection that's present 360 degrees. And he also has a superotemporal nodule in the left eye. Fundus exam is, is normal, no chorioretinal lesions. So um, from here, I think the questions that we really want to answer are, and I always tell the patients this when they're coming in for, for their initial assessment. Why do you have this? And what do we need to do about it? That, that's really the heart of, of this talk. And those, that's a line I stole from uh, Dr. Eric Suler, who I trained with. And I think it's a really nice way to frame this discussion for the patients. So before I talk about um, how I worked up this patient, I just want to talk a little bit about scleritis and its association with systemic disease so that we have some framework about how to, how to do this workup. Um, so scleritis is often associated with systemic disease, and it's also often associated with ocular complications. Some of the associated systemic conditions may be life-threatening, so we should always work up these patients, and they may also be vision-threatening. Um, the systemic diseases are typically going to be broken down into either infectious or autoimmune. So, of course, we need to identify what the etiology is before we're going to choose what therapy we're going to use. There was a really nice paper that was published, gosh, I think it was around 2004. Um, and this paper came out of Wilmer at Johns Hopkins. And what they did was they looked at 243 scleritis patients and they reviewed their charts and determined whether the inflammation was idiopathic or whether there was an associated infectious or rheumatic disease. And what they found was that 56% of those cases were idiopathic. Now, what's important to remember about these idiopathic scleritis cases is that almost or almost all or all of those cases are still autoimmune. They're just not associated with any underlying systemic condition. So those idiopathic cases, we're still going to treat them as though they're autoimmune. And so what they found was 44% of those patients had either an infectious or a rheumatic disease. Now, the majority of those cases were rheumatic diseases. So 37% overall had rheumatic disease and 7% had infectious disease. So now we can delve a little bit more deeply into those rheumatic diseases and what were the more common ones associated. So again, overall, 37% of scleritis cases are associated with rheumatic disease. The most common one out of all of them is going to be rheumatoid arthritis. So 15% of scleritis cases overall are associated with rheumatoid arthritis. 9% um, have systemic vasculitis. So this is a broad category, but out of the systemic vasculitis cases, the most common one we're going to see is what we now call GPA or granulomatosis with polyangiitis. We used to call this Wegner's granulomatosis, but now we call it GPA. Um, we can also see this with polyarteritis nodosum, Takayasu's arteritis, GCA, and Bichette's. I've seen a handful of these other um, vasculitides listed, but those are gonna be the, the more common ones. 4% of scleritis cases will have lupus. 3% have inflammatory bowel disease. Two and a half percent have spondyloarthropathy. So this is going to be the HLA B27 associated cases like ankylosing spondylitis, reactive arthritis, and psoriatic arthritis. One and a half percent will have relapsing polychondritis, and about two percent will have sort of some sort of 
other um, rheumatic disease. So that might be undifferentiated mixed connective tissue disease, polymyalgia rheumatica or pyoderma gangrenosum. Now there, will, there could be other diseases as well, but this was only 243 patients overall. What I wanna do here is briefly review um, a, a few more findings that were seen in this study. So what was interesting in this particular review is that they found that 78% of these patients that had an, a systemic disease, we already knew about that disease before they came in with scleritis. So what that means is this patient comes into your clinic, they have scleritis, but we already know that they have rheumatoid arthritis, for example. 14% of patients that had an associated disease were diagnosed with it because they came in with scleritis. And 8% developed a systemic disease during follow-up. So they may not have GPA right now, but it sort of evolved into it over time and became more obvious. Or I see that more with things like inflammatory bowel disease, where they may develop later on. Um, interestingly, in patients that had a systemic disease that wasn't vasculitis, so this is like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, inflammatory bowel disease, for the most part, 84% of them already had their systemic di diagnosis before they came in. And 8.8% were diagnosed because they came in with scleritis. So what that means is that if you have somebody with lupus or rheumatoid arthritis associated scleritis, it, about 84% of them already know that they have that before they come into your clinic. But interestingly, among vasculitis patients, so your Wegener's patients, only 59% already have their diagnosis systemically before they come in with scleritis, which means 27% of them were diagnosed with their systemic vasculitis because they came in with scleritis. And what's really important to keep in mind about that point is many of the systemic vasculitis diagnoses are life-threatening, especially Wegener's. And so a higher proportion of those patients don't know that they have that disease and ultimately get diagnosed with it because they came in with scleritis. So it's really important to always work up these patients for vasculitis when they come into your clinic because we don't wanna miss something that's life-threatening. So I briefly wanna review some of the presenting symptoms or um, diagnostic criteria for the more common etiologies that are associated with scleritis. And the reason it's important to think about this is that when you're doing a history and a review of systems, you wanna know what to ask the patient because a lot of the patients are not going to tell you this information unless you ask about it specifically. So with RA, basically they, they have a scoring system and you have to have at least six points from a possible 10 points um, among the diagnostic criteria. So you would look at the number of uh, and site of involved joints. So you just wanna make sure you're asking these patients whether they have joint swelling and pain, especially in their hands and their wrists and their larger joints like their elbows, hips, and knees. And then they also will get either two or three points if they have a positive rheumatoid factor or anti-CCP. They get more points if they have a higher number. And then they also will get a point if they have an elevated SED rate or CRP. So that's why we often order these tests as well. And they also get a point for symptom duration at least six weeks. With lupus, one thing that's important to remember is that we often test ANA in these patients, but an ANA by itself will not make a diagnosis of lupus. They have to meet at least four out of the following 11 diagnostic criteria. Um, so this is going to be the malar rash is that typical butterfly rash that we think of with lupus patients, uh, photosensitivity, a discoid rash. They can have oral and nasopharyngeal ulcers that are usually painless, um, arthritis involving two or more peripheral joints. So they'll have joint pain or swelling, serositis. So this is going to be either pleuritis or um, inflammation in the lung lining or pericarditis, renal disorder, which we're typically going to see with urine analysis neurologic disorders, which is seizures or psychosis, hematologic disorders, and then again, the positive AMA. So you wanna make sure you're asking your patients about these things. And then GPA, um, which is also one of the more common findings we see with scleritis. This is a multi-system autoimmune disorder. And the classic presenting triad is this necrotizing granulomatous vasculitis of the upper and lower respiratory tracts. They also get focal segmental glomerulonephritis, 
and necrotizing vasculitis of the small arteries and veins. So these patients typically will have paranasal sinus disease as a classic presentation. So they have, you know, everybody in Houston has sinus congestion. So that is not a particularly uh, sensitive or specific finding with uh, Wegner's, but it's something I always ask about. This condition is reported to have an 80% one year rate of mortality if it's not treated. So we always wanna make sure that we're thinking about this in these patients. Um, so they tend to present with constitutional symptoms, sinusitis with epistaxis, pulmonary symptoms, plus or minus hemoptysis. Um, they'll have sort of a nonspecific arthritis and hearing loss and tinnitus is a common symptom I see as well. We diagnose GPA with tissue biopsy ideally. Um, we should include a chest X-ray to screen for this as well. And they tend to have diffuse nodular or cavitary lesions. And then on lab work, the really important thing to order is ANCA. So there are two different types of ANCA that we usually look for, C ANCA and P ANCA. Um, the C ANCA is both sensitive and specific for GPA. And P ANCA is typically associated with polyarteritis nodosum, relapsing polychondritis, and renal vasculitis. Um, you can have either C or P ANCA with GPA. And they also often will have elevated sed rate and CRP, although this test, of course, is nonspecific. And they will often have abnormal urine analysis as well, which is typically manifested as blood in the urine. So I want to circle back around before we go to our patient to the infectious causes of scleritis. So 7% of cases are infectious. Again, 93% autoimmune, 7% infectious. In this series of patients, which was 243 people, 4.5% um, were varicella zoster, 1.6% were herpes simplex. So vast majority of infectious cases are virus, viruses in the herpes family. 0.4% um, were syphilis in this series. Now, because this was a relatively small sample size, we're not seeing some of the other causes. So tuberculosis is definitely also going to be on this list, especially in somebody with nodular scleritis. I always test for tuberculosis. And then there can be other bacterial etiologies as well, although we'll typically see trauma or some sort of surgery as a preceding event for those cases. So the way that I handle a lab workup for a patient that's coming in with scleritis is I'll perform a focused workup that depends on their exam findings, their review of systems, and their risk factors. Typically, I get a CBC with differential and comprehensive metabolic panel on everybody. That will show us if they have anemia and if they have any kidney dysfunction. ANCA, again, we get that on everybody because we want to make sure we're getting GPA and other types of systemic vasculitis covered. Rheumatoid factor and anti-CCP as well as ANA are commonly ordered tests on scleritis and HLA B27 as well. Everybody in my clinic with any kind of ocular inflammation gets an RPR, even though it only represents a tiny fraction of scleritis cases, although I see much higher rates of syphilis in uveitis patients. I always just tell the patients, listen, this is a treatable cause of uveitis. It's something that can be cured with antibiotics and I don't wanna miss something I can fix. And that's how I rationalize it because a lot of them are, are a little bit taken aback when I tell them that I'm testing them for syphilis. Um, I get a chest x-ray and urine analysis on all of these patients as well. And then colonoscopy is really only if they have symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease, which I would coordinate through their PCP or a GI specialist. In terms of treating scleritis, um, there was a, a paper that also came out of the group at Wilmer, which was published in 2000. So some of the data is a little bit outdated in terms of the treatments that we have now. But what they found in that study was that scleritis was controlled with oral NSAIDs in about a third of patients. This was before Durazol existed. So what I find is that mild to moderate cases, many of them will respond to topical Durazol. And many cases, if they don't respond to Durazol alone, will respond to Durazol in combination with oral NSAIDs. But about 70% of cases end up requiring oral prednisone. Um, about a third can be handled with prednisone and tapered down to low doses, but about 25% of the cases will ultimately end up requiring systemic immunosuppression. Um, so in terms of immunosuppressive therapy, which we use for autoimmune cases in which we can't taper the steroids down to low doses, we have many different drug classes to choose from. Traditionally, we start with anti-metabolites. So that's gonna be methotrexate, mycophenolate, and azathioprine. 
most people don't really use IL-2 inhibitors and we don't use alkylating agents as much as we used to now that we have biologic therapy. So the way I typically approach it is um, if it's a milder case or at least a, not a severe case, we'll start with anti-metabolites, but those take three months before they start working. Um, if it's a severe case or if we've identified a specific systemic condition that benefits from certain therapies, then we'll go straight to either TNF-alpha inhibitors, which would be either Humira or Remicade, um, rituximab, which has shown really good efficacy in treating scleritis, or sometimes we'll use IL-6 inhibitors like Actemra. Um, there's a study that came out a few years ago called the Systemic Immunosuppressive Therapy for Eye Diseases Cohort Study, or the SITE study. And one of the specific questions they tried to answer here was how effective are the different immunosuppressive therapies that we have for both uveitis and scleritis, they broke it down into different uveitis and scleritis categories. And what they found was that methotrexate, the efficacy at six months was only about a third, 37%. And at a year, it was 58%. Mycophenolate was a little bit better for scleritis, 50% at six months and 86% at a year. As a biopren actually had very pretty low rates of efficacy for scleritis at 22% at six months and 35% at a year. Um, they didn't actually have enough data to collect on the newer medications. Um, but the way that I typically handle it, so I'm going to go a little bit faster here because I think we're running short on time. Um, usually I'll start with an anti-metabolite and then I'll move on to either Humira or Remicade or Rituximab, depending on the situation. So I'm going to circle back to our case now. Um, our differential diagnosis with this patient, again, is most likely this is autoimmune because it's bilateral. Interestingly, with this patient, he, um, he's a super, super smart guy, and he was just convinced that because he had been gardening and some soil went into his eye, he had convinced himself that he had nocardia infection in his eye. Um, and he, there was a little bit of a denial element here because he just... Um, he just couldn't believe that with him being so healthy that he could possibly have a systemic condition. But um, with the bilateral inflammation and just the lack of, it just didn't look consistent with a bacterial infection um, to me. I was more suspicious that this was autoimmune. So with him, I ordered a CBC with differential, a comprehensive metabolic panel, ANCA, HLA, B27, RPR, quantifuron. I went ahead and got HSV and varicella titers, um, sed rate and CRP, rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP, ANA, UA with micro, and chest x-ray. And what we found in this patient is that his C-ANCA was positive with a 1 to 80 titer. His creatinine, fortunately, was normal, so his kidneys were functioning well, but he did have 3-plus occult blood in his urine. His ANA was also positive at a very high titer. It was 1 to 1280. His rheumatoid factor and his anti-CCP were both negative. His sed rate and CRP really looked good, and his RPR was non-reactive and quantifuron was negative. So um, my suspicion in this patient was that he had granulomatosis with polyangiitis or Wegener's granulomatosis. Um, if you recall at his presentation, he had simultaneous onset with the ocular symptoms of auditory symptoms of hearing loss, pressure in the ear and tinnitus. He has sinusitis symptoms, although no epistaxis. And he had a new onset of wrist pain. So that constellation of findings is very concerning for GPA. Um, what I did was I started him on 60 milligrams of oral prednisone, and, which he really did not respond to, and I referred him to rheumatology. The rheumatologist agreed that most likely this was GPA. However, the patient declined having a renal biopsy. He actually even declined having a chest x-ray, um, and we started him on IV solumedrol, and eventually we're able to start him on rituximab therapy. Um, and what we know with GPA is that it is very, very responsive to rituximab specifically. So these are some follow-up photos of our patient. So the before photo here shows his right eye when he was taking 60 milligrams of oral prednisone. So you can see that there was really um, very minimal response to prednisone. And um, Dr. Henry, please correct me if I'm wrong about these photos, but the timeline I believe is that this is about six weeks after he received rituximab therapy, and he's already down to 15 milligrams of oral prednisone. So you can see that there's a dramatic improvement here after starting rituximab. And here's the left eye, again, about six weeks after receiving rituximab therapy. 
So here he is on 60 milligrams of oral prednisone. And then the after photo is showing on 15 milligrams of oral prednisone after receiving rituximab. And then with a little bit more time here, so five months post rituximab, we can see that there's even more improvement here in that left eye. You can also see that he's got some scleral thinning there superiorly in the left eye from that severe scleritis that he presented with. And then this is the last photo, again, showing that dramatic improvement post rituximab. So I think what we want to highlight with this case is with scleritis cases, we always want to do a systemic workup. We always want to make sure that we're ruling out um, specifically systemic vasculitis. And this is an opportunity where we can really um, do something that's life changing for this patient by diagnosing a systemic condition that's potentially life threatening. And we also are able to use that systemic diagnosis to guide therapy and, and to get him on the rituximab, which is the appropriate therapy and has really given us this dramatic response. So I wanna thank you all so much for your attention and open up the forum for any questions that anyone may have. That was a great talk, Kelly. Thank you. <clears throat> Wow, Kelly, thank you so much. That was outstanding. Chris, did you like it? <laughs> I'm pumped up. That was awesome. All right. That's, uh, scleritis is great. I mean, and with the combination of both Dr. Fish's sort of rapid fire and run through retina and Dr. Larkin's focused really exam and, and, and treatment and diagnosis of scleritis is sort of a, a really, I thought, a very, very nice combo. So thank you very much, Dr. Fish. Thank you very much, Kelly Larkin. Fantastic talks. I learned a lot. Um, <clears throat> to wrap the CE up, because we do not want to be late and we're at the end of time. So how do you contact RCTX? Call that number uh, and refer. you can also refer online or a fax referral. It's all there for you. So the website has the ability to um, uh, refer a patient directly through, through the website. And... Let's see here, one more slide. Yes, so thank you for participating. How do you get your CE, you're wondering? Uh, Sarah Barbatano, whose name and number is there. Your CE credits, your registration was captured by Zoom. You're totally set, That's, we don't need anything else from you. We will submit for you the one hour of therapeutic CE to the Texas Optometry Board. Please note in your calendars in about two months or so, <clears throat> June 9th, uh, we'll have our next upcoming CE. So none in May, but early June. So you should be all set for CE. Any questions or problems, again, please contact Sarah Barbatano, whose email and number at the bottom. We're always very appreciative of the care you give our patients, and hopefully we provide for your patients. It's a two-way street. We know this, and we thank you very much and are honored to be able to participate in the care of your patients. Thank you very much for attending tonight. CE. See you June the 9th. Mark it on your calendars. Thank you so much. Thanks, all.